Hello, everyone, and welcome to A La Carte, a podcast about NBC's Hannibal. Um, my name is Josh Carter. I'm Britt Bird. <laughs> we are sitting down here today, with glasses of wine in hand, to talk about the new season of Hannibal, episode 301, called Antipasto. Antipasto. Directed by Vincenzo Natali, written by Brian Fuller and Stephen Lightfoot. Um, all right, so, uh, I guess to start off, we'll talk about the format of the show. Uh, we're going to start with an episode recap, uh, kind of go through all the scenes, talk about little things that we saw and noticed, uh, talk about the storyline as a whole, and then about halfway through, we're going to get into, uh, some conjectures. We have both read all of... Um, Thomas Harris's books based on Hannibal and we have also seen all of the episodes of Hannibal the TV show so this podcast kind of got born out of long conversations of conjecture and highlights of pointing out things from the books and stuff like that Um, comparing books to movies movies to show back and forth and so on and so on very much so so um, we thought we'd start Putting it down on tape. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's get into the recap. Um, we start in Paris, mm-hmm. of all places. Yeah. Uh, Hannibal riding a motorcycle, which just hit me close to the heart. <laughs> Immediately, um, you're like, "Is he riding a triumph? He's riding a triumph!" <laughs> yeah, I was all over that. Um, a beautiful Paris backdrop. Interestingly. Uh, Brian Fuller on his Twitter while he was live tweeting the show said that that was shot the same week as the Charlie Hebdo yeah. attacks, and he yeah. dedicated that whole sequence to them, which was it's pretty fantastic. Uh, yeah, pretty great thing for a showrunner to acknowledge. Um, One thing I really appreciated about this opening montage uh, in Paris was how isolated he looked against the the landscape there was always it was always very distinctive that you could see him on the motorcycle like it was always he was very isolated in this beautiful beautiful world um which gets into something that i'll touch in later which is about uh loneliness in this episode touch on later touch on later (laughs) touch in later um yes and that you know another highlight of the that opening sequence too is just brilliant insert shots that this show does and mm. we start actually inside of the motorcycle engine and then come out and we see yeah. the table on yeah. the motorcycle um which me being a gearhead i absolutely loved <laughs> um and then he arrives at a dinner party which was i found it funny that he usually you know he's so dapper and well put together mm. and wearing a suit and he shows up to a dinner party season. full of yeah. Full of people in suits and he's wearing a leather jacket. I mean, I yeah, no, I funny. feel like it, it definitely played up the predator and prey aspect of that entire sequence, which yes. is literally him uh, on on the hunt, so to speak, yes. for his dinner. So. Definitely. There was definitely, uh, there's that old adage in, in television that you don't show the shoe leather. Mm-hmm. This entire opening sequence is almost all shoe leather, but the the show does it in such an interesting way and those yeah. crossfades and yeah. you know, you're building up the yeah. room and who's there and yeah. all these things just Absolutely. through inserts and no dialogue or anything mm-hmm. until we get to Mr. Anthony Dimond. Oh, Tom. Is it Dimond or Dumond? Dimond. Dimond. Yes. Played by the wonderfully talented Tom Wisdom, who is mm-hmm. literally a tiny baby little finger. He looks yes. he looks like a tiny Aiden Gillian. It's it's Aiden. bizarre. <laughs> so then through uh Mr. Dimond we get introduced to Dr. Fell mm. who is uh I don't believe shows up in the book Hannibal or the movie Hannibal. Uh he is in the book Hannibal. Uh Dr. Fell uh, as we soon realize in this scene, is the intended target for the evening because he is occupying a position as a curator that Hannibal desperately wishes to fill. So we, uh, yeah, but he is in the book. Well, he's not. He's not occupying the position yet. Yes, he is. 
No. Dr. Fell in the... Sh that's like, the identity that Hannibal assumes. Assumes after he kills Dr. Fell. Dr. Fell but is in that position. He wouldn't kill Dr. Fell and then take the name Dr. Fell. He killed somebody else. Who I think that's the character that's in the book. And that little sparring match between Saliato and Hannibal, I believe in the book, takes place between the previous curator. No, that, that happens between Saliato. It does? And okay. Hannibal, yeah. Um... No, but the the Fell is not the current curator because he's living in Paris. No, Fell is the current curator. No, yeah, yeah, yes. In the right. episode, Hannibal literally says, "Like he's giving a speech. You should come see it." No, no, no yes. When they're in Florence. Yes, but the, when he kills Doctor Fell in the intro at this dinner party scene, Doctor yeah. Fell is not currently the curator at the Palazzo. Is he not? Hannibal takes his identity, and then Hannibal gets the job as the curator. He wins the job as the curator and translator. Um, and I believe in the book, he is already Dr. Fell when the book starts. Is he not? Oh, so, uh, Mr. DeMond and Hannibal talk about uh, Dr. Fell. And how he is very much a person that they both find rude, in a way. Yeah. Um, he has that great line, is, if you agree with me, blink. And you see the Hannibal's usual steady gaze just... Slow blink. Blinks at him. <laughs> um, it's a great little moment. Uh, and then the scene ends with uh, Hannibal sitting out on his bike and Dr. Fell coming out and... We get the first of three Bon Swads. Which I feel like in the Hannibal fandom will forever now mean I'm going to kill and eat you. <laughs> if you yes. just say Bon Swad to somebody, it's, it's, the <laughs> it's, new, it's the kiss of death. <laughs> it's the new eat the rude. Yes, totally. So he uh, bids Dr. Fell good evening. And Dr. Fell returns. And then uh, we see him pull away. And then that great reveal shot as Dr. Fell is walking up to his own house. And we... That slow pan behind his leg. He's Hannibal on the bike. That, yeah, that great yeah. side reveal of uh, Hannibal sitting there. And he curiously says, good evening, again. Yeah. To which Hannibal responds, good evening. And, and oddly enough, uh, this is the first time, I think, in this episode of something that kind of occurs regularly of Hannibal looking directly into the camera. Yes, he does it twice in this episode. I counted five. Really? Yeah. Holy oh, God. I was it, more... It happens, it happens quite a bit. I was more connecting to uh, the cannibalism pun count, oh, <laughs> of which I counted a few. There were quite a few... <laughs> which I find puns, that... Which is... I find that interesting. Motif. It is, right. Well, I find that interesting, too. That there is so much of him looking directly at the camera because, uh, you know, in Silence of the Lambs, there's a lot of that. Very they much use so, yeah. a lot of that to um, break up how Clarice looks at the camera or how Clarice connects with the audience versus how all of the other characters around her don't look directly at the camera like she does, which and I think is really interesting and maybe, you know, might be a little tip of the cap to the films or not. Yes, but. and there's also, um, if you want to learn more about that, there's a fantastic. Uh, visual essay online by a man named Tony. Uh, oh, I always get his. I always mispronounce his last name. Apologies in advance, yes, Tony. Uh, Tony. I'm gonna butcher it. <laughs> it's like it's pronounced like G, but mm. it's spelled Z H O U. Um, but I, I saw him tweet about how to pronounce his name one time, and oh. it's, it's pronounced very different than it's spelled. Anyway, this, anyway. <laughs> the video essay series is called Every Frame of Painting, and he does one that f talks about eye lines, mm -hmm. in, specifically mm -hmm. in Silence of the Lambs, mm -hmm. and how how the director uses that to transmit power yeah. between characters and show their relationship and when it yeah. when they fall in and out of line, um, which very much comes into play with yeah. uh, the flashbacks that we see later on yeah. in the episode. Then uh, Hannibal gets his first kill of the season. Yeah. We see him... Uh, cooking up Dr. Fell's liver, mm -hmm. some red wine, and then Dr. Fell's wife, who we hear mentioned later on in the episode, yep. returns home and Lydia. 
again, Hannibal looks directly into the camera and bids her bonsoir. bonsoir. <laughs> <laughs> and straight to straight to the opening credits. Right. It's a great little intro, just a little, you know, I mean, it's fantastically written that you can and directed that you can mm -hmm. carry a five-minute scene with three characters only using one word for you yeah. know, a good five minutes of the show. Yeah. So straight out of the opening credits, we get uh, our first flashback of the episode, mm -hmm. which um, I love that the they changed the aspect ratio. Yes. Yeah. In addition to in these scenes taking the color completely yes. out, which I wonder if. Yes that has a specific purpose. Well, and and welcome uh, back to my television, Eddie Izzard, because I love you, and I'm so happy that you're back on my TV. Good old Abel Gideon. Good old Abel Gideon. <laughs> Missing both of his legs. Yes, which um, is very quickly revealed to be under a, mm -hmm. um, a covered serving platter. Yes. Um, yes. With, uh, what was it? He said... Um, uh, sugar cane. Sugar, sugar cane, cane stems. St st yeah, sugar cane stems. He said, you will literally fall off the bone. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good line. He makes another reference to my, my last leg standing next to me. Mm -hmm. So good. So good. Um, Abel, this is your flashbacks to, you know, moments in the second season when he's forced to eat himself and he takes his first bite and he says, my compliments to the chef. Yeah. Uh, and, and now he's changed his tune a little bit and he's, he's bucking bucking back against Hannibal. He's making such wonderful observations about Hannibal, though, too, because it literally, I mean, he, there's nothing left for him to do but, you know, comply and basically be fattened up for the slaughter. But, you know, he's going to go out swinging, which I love the, 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 the hits that he's getting in on Hannibal, so to speak, is that he's making these observations that... Yeah, this is very, uh, it's not a very Hannibal-centric episode, actually. It's, I mean... He doesn't, it, he doesn't really... He's he is the focus of many scenes, but he he doesn't really talk a lot. He doesn't really explain it, himself like we're used it's to a, seeing. It's with a very with Will Graham. it's a very reactionary episode for the uh, for the other players. You see a lot of uh, people making observations about him and people reacting to what he does, but there's not a lot that he actually gives us other than uh, the loneliness, which I mentioned earlier, and we'll get into later. But I mean. I have I have a lot of thoughts on the characters that uh, the characterization of Hannibal that's going on in this episode that will probably carry on into the season. I'm assuming we'll see. But yes, part of that being he yeah. is referred to as the devil. The devil, which yes, is, uh, which comes up several times mm -hmm. throughout this episode. There's a strong uh, devil Dante Inferno theme that happens in this episode, which makes complete sense. I mean, mm -hmm. Brian Fuller has talked about in interviews mm -hmm. before that he views. Hannibal as Lucifer, as that fallen angel that's fallen in love with mankind. Mankind, yeah. Um, yeah. Which is kind of a weird way to think about the devil, but that's here down there. Um, again, we see Hannibal looking into the camera uh, as he intros his time in Florence with Let It Be a Fairy Tale. Yeah. And Once Upon, Once a, time, upon a Time. We cut instantly to curtains. Beautiful shot. I love the theatricality of this moment of the of the black and white into vibrant Technicolor. It it, it that made me really happy. It made me for some reason. It, it made me think of Wes Anderson. You know, you see a like, yeah. Royal Tenenbaums. Yeah, yeah, the curtains open. It's they, yeah. There's, uses there's very, it's very much a. There's a lot of theatricality to this scene with uh, the wonderful Bedelia. Um, also, welcome back to my television, Gillian Anderson, because you are the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person that I need on the show at all times. Um, yeah, she's fantastic in this scene. and um, She's so good. We are introduced to Professor Saliato from the Hannibal universe, mm -hmm. both of book and film. Yes. A uh, rival professor that doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. like Hannibal or trust Hannibal. I definitely... I feel like this um, this characterization of him though is much more in tune with the inspector. Yes. I cannot remember his name. Uh, uh, Pazzi. Inspector Pazzi. Fran uh, Fran Francisco de Pazzi. And it'll be interesting to see um, how his character plays out through the the rest of the season. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's a very important 
character of, of yeah. Hannibal Lore. Gosh, but yeah, we see absolutely. him verbally spar with Hannibal about Hannibal's grasp of Dante and whether or not he's qualified for yeah. the position of curator and translator at the Palazzo. I think what's uh, what's really interesting about this this exchange between Hannibal and, and Saliato is that um, I think in the, the, the series so far, uh, we have not seen Hannibal get really, um, we don't see him get his, his feathers ruffled so much. Uh, he's, he's very much always in control. And if he is affected by something, it never shows on his face. Um, I thought there was a little bit of a glimpse of this like human side of Hannibal in this moment with Saliato, where Saliato is literally insulting him to his face and telling him that you are not qualified for this position. And we see a little bit of a human side of him come out where he, you know, as, as Saliato walks away, Hannibal makes the decision of like, I'm going to recite perfect Dante's Inferno to you right now in perfect Italian. Sonnet. It was a sonnet. Oh, was it a sonnet? It I thought sonnet. it was literally from Dante's Inferno. No, because he has that great moment where he, you know, turns around and looks at the crowd and says, Dante's first sonnet. And yeah, yeah. Everybody, you know, instantly starts clapping. And of course. But I thought that, impressed. I thought that was, I think that's worth noting just because it plays into other observations that I've made about this episode and just the season thus far, I think is, um, uh, it's going to be a side of Hannibal that we haven't seen before, which is more human and a little bit more relaxed even he's definitely in his element which actually takes us right into the next scene where we see him in uh what i guess would be his dining room of his apartment or i guess it would just be an apartment it was just yeah i mean i think more than anything i think it's just like his living room sort of ish into his and he's there with bathroom. bedelia and he talks about um having found peace in Florence and him not wanting to yeah. disturb that piece where he's... I found a piece here. I've hardly killed anyone at all. Um, and to which she banters back mm -hmm. about morality and how his... He's not killing based on killing being, you know, a necessary evil for his life or right. anything, but that it's... Right. He's found a place that is aesthetically pleasing to him, yeah. and therefore he has yeah. taken a break from his other habits and needs. Yeah, and, and again, that plays back into the general theme of this season, which I think is what we'll see, is m especially the time that we spend in Italy with Hannibal and Medelia. I think we're going to see more of the, um, it's less about ethics, it's more about aesthetics for him now. Because again, he, he's, he's more in his element. Uh, I think this this general the general theme of the episodes that we'll see of them in Italy it's going to be less about the ethics and more about the aesthetics and I love that the show is so aware that it even says that like they literally have a character saying like <laughs> very much and right after that you cut to that wide shot and you right. see the ceiling of his apartment and right. it's just covered in this ornate right. painting yeah and I mean this is a guy that he he appreciates beauty and and and, and even even murdering is art like even the gruesome parts of the show are still beautiful. And this also, I feel like, might be the first season that we fully see the world through his eyes for the first time. We get glimpses of it in the, in past seasons, but I think this this first episode is so through Hannibal's eyes. It's, it's it, I mean, it's, it's, it's beautiful, but it's also really, really frightening to watch at the same time. That's very true. Uh, Bedelia decides that she... Uh, is going to go take a bath, and they continue to have their little discussion about morality and morals, and she says that she feels like she's in conscious control of herself, um, and that for her is a good day based on Hannibal's history with people How that manipulative. he calls close friends. Yeah, yeah. very manipulative. Um, and then we see her in the bath mm -hmm. slide underneath the water, and have almost this fever dream of her herself floating in blackness. That that touches on what I mentioned earlier about the the visual um, and the the psychological, I guess, uh, representation of this world that we're it, it it's that you're being immersed into. There's a lot of there's a lot of use of liquids in this episode, which um, I mean, even in the 
the afterward that we, you know, that you can watch with Brian Fuller and, and Jillian Anderson, uh, it, that was very much an intentional thing. It's very, it's a very psychological, psychological representation of she is literally immersing herself in this world. And, uh, I, even, I, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I, I really appreciated the visual of her talking about, uh, when he, when he asked her, how do you feel today? And she says, today I feel that I am in complete control. Um, even as she's saying that, uh, there's a shot of her hand underneath the running faucet. And I thought that was just, I thought that was really interesting because it's like, literally she is filling up the tub of this black water and she is completely in control as she says, but she's still, and, and, and she's willingly immersing herself in this world as terrifying as it may be. It's still, interesting. it's a really interesting, uh, Moment. I didn't necessarily read it that way. I I read it as a very uh, very direct callback to a shot in a sequence last season with Alana Bloom. Yes, yeah. Where she is over. She's in the bed, and the black sheets mm-hmm. take her over. I think I think that is, and, and you know, it, I, who knows? It might be a it might be a direct callback to that sequence. I interpreted that sequence more as she was being. Uh, unwillingly taken over by Hannibal's world. I took Bedelia in the bathtub as she was willingly submerging herself in this in this lifestyle and making this conscious choice of I am I am being a willing participant of this, uh, which plays in later in the episode where he literally asks, "Are you participating? Or are you observing?" Yes. And, yeah. So what I find interesting about that sequence and uh, is that. When she pops up mm-hmm. out of the water and you see her gasping for air and she's, you know, she almost feels like she's drowned. It's, yeah. You you kind of get the sense of overwhelming power over her and everyone else that Hannibal has. It's almost like yeah. oh, for gosh, her to yeah. be involved, you know, to for her to be immersed in that world. Yeah. She starts to get the feeling that this is going to be the end of her. And after that, you know, throughout the rest of the episode, you see her become yeah. a little bit more and more. There's a lot un- of unhinged. Yes, well, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of baptismal um, parallels, and later on, even some Judas parallels. That that that's why I think the the use of the the how much they show liquid, how much they show water, or some form of liquid is baptism it's yeah there's a little bit of like this bad there's this weird baptismal thing about bedelia and her being baptized into this world so interesting um after that we move on to a second flashback and this uh including bedelia and uh the great lawrence fishburne Mm mm-hmm as uh, Jack Crawford. Welcome back to our TV. Yeah, it's a it's a flashback to a scene where uh, he is asking her to betray Hannibal mm-hmm. and admit that Hannibal killed her prior patient. Yeah. Um, and she kind of covers it up and she says that no, it was she did it and it was self defense. And then right after that, well, I'm, no, that flashback scene was less to do about the patient. It was more to it, it. Literally, that that was the scene. But the lot, the the specific cut of that scene was more of the. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're in control here. Hannibal will always be in control, and if and if you think that you are in control, it's because he wants you to believe that. Mm-hmm. And then it cuts to her house, uh, and we see um, we see that she is not alone. <laughs> yes, Hannibal is washing himself of blood. Tan lines! (laughs) Tan lines! Which I still don't, I don't really understand that reference. Maybe I've just, I haven't seen that on him, so I don't know. No, I mean, literally, like, this, like, the out-of-focus silhouette of him, there's clearly a tan line on his, on his, on his ass. Uh, Yes. (laughs) So. His, his very pale. His very pale ass. That places this scene after the events of the finale last year, where Hannibal guts... Will Graham cuts Jack Crawford's throat and um, kills Abigail. Kills Abigail by also cutting her throat. Yep. Um, so we see him washing himself clean, and when he exits the shower, Bedelia has a gun trained on him. Which I love that shot where it cuts to the the reverse, 
and you see her holding the glass perfectly mm -hmm. over his over his crotch. I think this is a fantastic shot. Kudos to Vincenzo Natale for getting away with a naked man on a network television show by using a wine glass. Or what a, was the hashtag that Brian Tumblr Fuller glass. used? Bubbles over boobs or something like that. <laughs> Bubbles over boobs. Bubbles for that, over boobs. For Bedelia's bath scene. Yes, yeah. yeah. And we see her in this scene, we see Bedelia being much more playful with Hannibal in her banter and in her mood and dialogue. She's I, a little... I don't know that it's playful so much as just, just like, they've always had this, like, really highbrow, like sexual but not sexual banter between the two of them and i just feel like in in contrast to the way that she and he interact throughout the rest of the episode she's much more light she's kind of you know she is the one in control in this situation she has a gun trained on him and he has to ask her for permission to get dressed and she kind of smirks as she says like yes you may um and we see her and then Throughout that conversation, he begins to assert control back onto her, um, and we start to see that she is... Oh, uh, it's... Uh, are you talking about the line where he says, um, you're optimistic that I won't kill you? I think it's the line right before that. I think he says human motivation... It might be human motivation coming down to greed. Lucid greed. Lucid yeah. greed, and then you see her A little say, more than lucid greed. She greed says greed, and, and he says... And, blind optimism yes yeah and when she says greed and blind optimism you can see those tears in her eyes and yeah, her voice is a little shakier and yeah she's, she's genuinely terrified i think yes I, I mean even though she has control that's the thing about hannibal even though you might think you have control i mean that's that she says it perfectly last season you might think you are in control but that is only because he wants you to think that literally Someone can have a gun trained on him, and he is still 100% in control of his environment and the situation, which is and terrifying. I think she realizes that, which is why she Absolutely. puts the she gun, puts down, the gun and, down. And she realizes that, you know, it's in that moment. If he's going to kill me, that, he's going to do it, yeah. you know. And I think in that moment, she, you know, that's where she sees that the only course of action she has is to yeah. go with him on that trip, you know. That, yeah, yeah strange little epilogue we saw at the end of last year where we were like wait what how did that happen now we get the explanation yeah, of how right, it happened right you know she wasn't exactly going willingly but she has to play a oh, right she has to play right. a role yeah in his fairy tale and then we see her in florence we see her grocery shopping at the vera doll um you know again beautifully shot scene fairly uneventful <laughs> uh, mostly shots of food and we get our, you know, we get the classic Hannibal food porn. <laughs> um, these luscious grapes and truffles and things like that. One interesting thing I noticed in that scene is the, the hanging rabbit um, by the counter, which is, in this instance, uh, just still and, and there. And then later on in the episode, we see her grocery shopping again and we see her the the rabbit's mouth is now bleeding onto the countertop and it's i think that is where that's placed uh later on the episode is very significant sign of her headspace and where she feels and and how out of control she feels and how much you know how how fearful for her life she is in that moment she feels like she is the bleeding dead rabbit hanging from the ceiling. Um, anyway. Then we see a little montage of Hannibal studying in the palazzo. Um, which, did you notice at one moment that as it was pulling back in the wide shot that ends the scene, there's a little devil that gets so superimposed over the whole scene? Um, no, it's not as direct as I the know, projector. The projector, yeah, the, the projector later, later on in the episode, episode is that's. <laughs> but yeah. it's like it's a little heavy-handed and a little obvious, but I don't care because I the sh the show can do no wrong in my eyes. So it was like you know that was definitely a moment where I was like, oh, you guys really. 
but I don't care. <laughs> that's yes. great. Well, I did not notice that, though. Yeah. That's really it's interesting. It's back in that, and it just very lightly fades in and then fades out. It never really quite... Uh, it's, changed. Yeah. It never really touched. did not notice that at all. So, yeah. again, there's a lot of that devil's, you know, the devil and Dante. There's a lot of, like, this religious sort of undertone that threads its way through this episode. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Yeah, so they, they have that superimposed devil. And uh, the other thing I noticed about it is it's surprisingly... The set design of that uh, room is surprisingly similar to the psych ward mm -hmm. we saw last season where they had these little square yeah, the, um, the cells yes. that in this case are holding yes. torture. Torture devices. Torture device. But uh, yeah, so there we see Hannibal studying. Um, and then as he's leaving, he runs into Mr. Dimond again. Um, and we get that fantastic little <laughs> little cannibalism. Um, <laughs> count one. Count hint, one. Um, yes. You know, my wife and I would love to have, have you, for, you dinner. for dinner. I need to. I need to give a shout out to Christopher uh, Hargadon for the costume design. Uh, specifically because, again, in talking about how I feel like this this episode really shows that Hannibal is really truly in his element. You see him a little bit more relaxed. I mean, like we talked about at the beginning of the episode, we see him enter an otherwise black tie affair in a leather motorcycle jacket. Mm -hmm. uh, we see him in this, like, really just sophisticated European cut gold suit but it's it's not as tailored it's not as structured mm -hmm. as as his suits in past seasons have been and i think he that looks that more like a yeah, college professor totally yeah and and it, it definitely lends lends you to the thinking that he is truly in his ed element here this is truly more an aesthetically pleasing environment for him than the states were where he was mm -hmm. you know in past seasons so Huge, huge shout out to the costume design for for this episode because I think it's just it it completely wraps it all up in one giant big bow and says here here's a beautiful cake for you to munch on. Mm -hmm. um, so he invites Dimond to dinner, um, and then we go straight to another flashback, this time involving snails to be made into escargot. Uh, one of the things that just made me laugh out loud, uh, and I still laugh out loud thinking about it, is Abel Gideon <laughs> just wheeling himself up in that little electric wheelchair. He reminds me of the... Not so Abel Gideon. <laughs> he reminds me of the mad scientist from Nightmare Before Christmas, where he just like wheels himself mm -hmm. around, and it's just like a little creepy guy. It's so funny to me that Hannibal... He went and bought this man an electric wheelchair so that he could still move around the house. Uh, it has the IV and everything there to keep him alive. Yeah. Uh, and we get this interesting discussion about the food chain and, and how the snails are being fattened on Abel. Mm hmm so that then Abel can eat the snails and be fattened for Hannibal. For Hannibal. To and, eat later. But, I, but what I love is that Abel literally, he like I said earlier, he... He goes out swinging. He's going to keep getting those punches in where he can with literally his one arm now where he's like, I wonder how you'll taste. I wonder what you'll do when this happens to you. You know, I, I love that. And it, so, again, it is an interesting call to the food chain, so to speak, um, where Abel is quite literally reminding Hannibal, you are not the top of the food chain. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be someone that's going to do this to you, mm -hmm. you know, and I wonder how you'll taste when this happens to you, you know. Interesting. I love that um, in this scene, directly tying it to the next scene, um, he lists a, a series of foods that Hannibal's making him eat yeah. in order to be fattened up. Yeah. And it's oysters, sweet wine, and nuts. Yeah. Um, in the very next scene, we see Mr. Dimond has come over for dinner, and sure enough, Hannibal is feeding him oysters, uh -huh. acorns, marsala, <laughs> and he makes a, sweet he, wine. He makes a remark even. He says, you know, in, in ancient Rome, this is what they would feed their, you know, pigs to fatten them up. Pigs or cattle? Pigs or cattle or something like cattle. that. Yeah. And I love it because I just feel like at this point, you know Hannibal as a character so well that, and Mads does such a great job of that, that ex, you know, his face is so expressive at all times. He literally doesn't have to say a word, but you can just see it in his mind of like, 
oh, you have to die. <laughs> You're on oh, to yes. me. I mean, you he, must die. The moment, <laughs> the moment he sees Dimond in the in Florence, you know, in he's court, like, yeah, you, know, you absolutely he, have to. It's yeah. the one person that could disturb his peace, and so right. Hannibal's going to have to yeah. disturb the peace um, yeah. ever so slightly to to maintain it. Yeah. Um, What's interesting to me about this scene specifically is the dynamic of sex and death yeah. um, that's being played out here, where yeah. Dimond is, is assuming that Bedelia is referring to sex in how Hannibal likes her to taste. Mm -hmm. uh, Bedelia is a bit caught off guard by this, mm -hmm. and so you, in that moment you realize she's referring to, like, she knows that Hannibal one day is going to kill her mm -hmm. and, and probably eat her. Um, and then you see Hannibal being the controller of both of those and kind of negating the sex. Mm -hmm. But in his mind, you know, he is doing exactly what Bedelia knows he's doing, which is right. he's fattening Dimond up um, for him to eat later. Next we see that scene that I talked about earlier where Bedelia goes to grab groceries again and we see the rabbit with the mouth... Yeah. Bleeding, um, which you were talking about costume design earlier, that outfit that she has, especially with the music, it's kind of that classic 60s spy jazz. Oh, God. Going as she's oh, walking yeah. through the courtyard and the policeman tips his hat. Um, just, yeah, that that entire costume was just serving me. Oh, it's fantastic. Carmen San Diego realness. I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um yeah, so you, you see her, and and in that moment, I read that rabbit as her coming, you know, fully to grips mm -hmm. with, you know, if she if she stays, she's going to die. Yeah. Um, and so we cut to her sitting at a train station, um, but we see it through the eyes of the security camera yeah. first. And then we see her at the end of the scene turn and look directly at the security camera and... Uh, to me, that's, I think that's her little subtle way of not necessarily wanting to jump on the train and leave, but trying to get on someone's radar. Um, you know, in her, you would assume the FBI is hunting Hannibal, and so that they would have reached out to Interpol and these other agencies. And That's interesting that you read it that way. Um, that's not at all how I, how, I, how I took that scene. Interesting. I, I took that scene as that she makes this trip to this little grocery store every day. Uh, and even the tip of the cap from the, the police officer as he passes her beside the carousel. Um, I took that as she has been walking this specific way to this grocery mm -hmm. store for weeks, months. Uh, and, and her acknowledging the security camera is literally just just that she's acknowledging that there is a security camera there she is sitting at this specific bench at this train station uh because she is literally mapping out how she what what way she would need to go and at what time of day to get away hmm. um so yeah i thought that i think that's interesting that you that's that 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 was more or less a cry for help Yes, in her own small way. In her way. own small way. I took that to mean that she has been walking the same way to that deli for months because she's literally mapping out that this is this is the best way to go at this specific time to get away. Interesting. Um, um, I guess we eventually will find out yeah, uh, I guess which one of those is right. Or if, if Do you have her right. second flashback on there? Uh, yes, okay, which cool. is coming up right next. Following the scene... Where we see her look directly into the security camera, we get a flashback to a scene that we've heard talked about quite a bit in the first and second season, mm -hmm. um, in which she's killed her patient. Yep. Um, and it's been fairly debated about whether or not it was her or Hannibal, Hannibal that actually yep. killed the patient. Yep. Um, the patient in this case is played by Zachary Quinto. Which I'll be excited to see more of this season because I assume he's going to appear in diff in further episodes. Yeah, he's playing a character named Neil Frank. Also, welcome back to my television, Zachary Quinto. <laughs> Happy to have you back. <laughs> NBC favorite, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, this scene it starts right in the middle of the scene and then flashes back to her actually committing the act yes, of killing. Yes, which 
it, it's still it's still very it doesn't give you a lot I mean it it doesn't give you the build up to that moment um which I'm you know I'm assuming and hoping anyway that they will in later episodes in the season but yeah it's 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 odd it starts as she wakes up and then it shows her actually committing the act and then it shows how she woke up, which is that she faints, and then she wakes up, and then there's Hannibal. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you had the thought that I did, which is that, um, was she maybe drugged in the same manner that that Will has been drugged in past, in, in last season? Yes, and I was going to... You get, had that thought, uh, too? Yes. Okay, good. I was going to more in... <laughs> yeah. Um, and kind of our conjectures and how that's going to play out yeah. um, through the rest of the season. But I definitely, uh, that's why I think it's so interesting that the scene starts in the middle and then flashes back to her actually committing yeah. the act. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you get a flashback inside of a flashback. Right. But um, that's so interesting because it plays out in very much the same way that Will has previously remembered. Yes. Um, eating the ear. Yeah, right. Per se. Right. Or, um, yeah. You know, killing uh, various other people that he was accused of killing in right. the first and second season. Right. It plays out very much in that manner, and yeah. so yes, I think that's I think that's going to come into play. I think so too. Later on, I think down so the too. season. Yeah. Um. So also in the scene, um, Hannibal, we see probably that first manipulation. Of of Bedelia, it's uh, this is very much her episode. It's yes. telling her story and, yes. and how she, yeah. you know, it's kind of an origin story for her in a mm -hmm. way, um, which it's so interesting. It plays from back to front instead of front to back. Yeah. Uh, but we see that first manipulation where he puts her into an impossible corner, and then offers his help. I will help you if you ask me. Yes, which That's... is very, which is very much what he did with Will. Yes. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And absolutely. Abigail Hobbs. It's yes. Exactly. It plays yeah. out almost exactly yeah. what he did with Abigail Hobbs in yeah. the first season. Yeah. Um, where he's caught her and she's accidentally accidentally stabbed. Right. Her friend's boyfriend, or was it a boyfriend or brother? I think it was boyfriend. I think it was boyfriend. Um, and then he offers to help her, and obviously for Abigail Hobbs, that didn't turn out too well. Well, and we see Bedelia is stuck in a. Yeah, and a and similar relationship now. Again, I think it it it's that plays back into the baptismal of Bedelia, as it were, um, where you see her, you know, in the bathroom and she's washing her arm off, and Hannibal comes up to her and he says, you know, I I will help you tell the story that you need to tell, but you have to ask me for help. And she looks at him and she says, I I need your help, and he takes the rag and he dabs it on her forehead and then we jump back to the present time which leads us into the next scene where he's giving his lecture and mm -hmm. she's dabbing sweat from for her from her forehead mm -hmm. so that's very i love that tie-in visually i love that tie-in between well, between enough, the past and the present and again that that's just something about the 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 usage of water and this cleansing sort of thing mm -hmm. between uh, between Hannibal and Medelia, where it's this baptismal of her into his into his world, she makes the conscious mm -hmm. choice to to accept his help, and that sets her on this chain of events that's led her to this moment. Mm -hmm. um, what's so cool about that transition is we talked about the aspect ratio earlier mm -hmm. and how they use that to signify flashbacks mm -hmm. in this episode, um, but the. The aspect ratio actually expands. It mm -hmm. doesn't just cut away from one to the other mm -hmm. like it has previously in the mm -hmm. episode, but you actually see the black bars go away mm -hmm. as it makes that transition from mm -hmm. her being dabbed to mm -hmm. dabbing her own forehead. Mm -hmm. um, it's so great. So in a way, she's come full circle. Yeah. You know, that's as much of her origin story as we need to know. Yeah. And and their relationship, it's a it's a full explanation of that. And like you said, it transitions right into Hannibal giving his lecture at the Palazzo uh, in front of that projector, which we get that beautiful <laughs> moment. And I I, I want to keep watching it because I want to figure out how they did that because it's so fantastic. Where you see the devil 
literally from Dante's Inferno, one mm-hmm. of the, the old drawings, superimposed directly over On his face. Hannibal's face. Yeah, it's um, so great. You know, the two faces line up. That's another, uh, that's another thing I took away from that scene, uh, speaking back to the religious connotations of this episode, um, because we have, up until this point, seen Bazilia be a willing participant, if not just a willing observer of, of Hannibal's lifestyle. Um, and that's, that's why this, this particular scene where he's giving the lecture, this particular scene with as many calls as there are to Judas and the, and the story of the betrayal, mm-hmm. um, that's why I go back and I look at that scene of her looking directly into the security camera as this will lead up to, and again, this might be something later for the episode, but uh, something to do with a potential betrayal for Bedelia. There's a lot of the, well, the he, Judas aspect of it. We yes. know that Will has been his Judas, and that's a big, big sore spot for him. So the way but I, I feel like Bedelia is working to that point as well. Oh, yes. And, well, in in my in the way I read that previous train scene, yeah. I believe that was her first act of betrayal. Uh-huh. And the reason I, I read it that way is the way she reacts when he's talking about betrayal. And he's listing all the How qualities. How she gets. And, well, he says it mm-hmm. right as he puts his hand on her shoulder. Mm. So there's a weird way that I think he already knows ah. that she's done something. Oh, how does he know this stuff? Uh, yeah, I, it, I I can't. I don't know how. With I can't, like previous, I can't justify with, it. But with like last season, and like with Alana and her, you know, smelling like gunpowder, and him being like, "Have you been firing a gun?" Like that, I can get on board with. That mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, that's super obvious. At least for Hannibal, for Hannibal standards, yes, he would be able to smell it on her. Literally, he can smell the betrayal on her. But with Bedelia, I'm like. Dude, unless you're completely following her at all times of day, how in the hell do you know that she's... So that's why I'm a little bit like, no, well, I think wa- she's been she's... mapping this out, and I literally well, think that that was just a gesture. That, she's, get shit, she's, she's getting paranoid that he's becoming suspicious, but I don't think he has a clue. But that's the thing about Hannibal, is he always I, does. I don't, I don't I think, know how. I think he, he may not know that she went to the train station, mm. specifically, and that she did the whole security well, camera thing. Later in the episode, he certainly knows that she was planning on leaving because she he literally walks in on her yes. with a bag in her hand. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, but I think he know he knows something is amiss, and he knows she's done something. He, um, yeah, maybe I don't. Yeah, I guess so he almost, can read people that well. Well, maybe maybe it's just as simple as like you know, like you said, if she's walking that same route every day, he knows how long she's gone. Yeah. And then one day she's gone for a half hour longer, and she she only went to the grocery store. And then he Good thinks, point. well, you know, yeah, where else have you been? And mm, then you know he can point. assume, and I mean, obviously their their relationship is on the rocks. Um, I hope that doesn't become a terrible cannibal pun later, but, um... (laughs) Either that will, or there will be something that pertains to that. (laughs) There will always be cannibal puns. (laughs) Um, But he, uh, he lays his hand on her as he's talking about betrayal and listing all these qualities of the, I think it's the seventh circle of hell. Yes, yes. As he's giving a speech on Dante, and Mr. DeMond uh, comes into the room. Oh, Tony. Um, which, right as he comes in, Bedelia notices him and then leaves. Promptly leaves. Uh, yeah. Very quickly. Skirts right on out of there. Um, which, I wonder if in that moment she thinks that if, if I go, I can get away because Hannibal's got a new play thing. I don't think it's that. No? I don't think it's a play thing thing. Play thing thing. <laughs> I think it's a... Uh, I think it's a I, I have I have a little bit of time here because he's gonna kill this guy. Um mm-hmm. I think that she knows I think she knows Hannibal well enough to know that uh this death will mean something. Mm-hmm. It will be it will be a show of something. It will be uh it will be an involved moment. It won't just be a simple slit of the throat, whatever. I, I think Bedelia recognizes that there is at least 
he's at least going to give this guy who has been catty and mm-hmm. rude, uh, he's going to give this guy his just desserts. I've got at least an hour to get out of here. Cannibal puns. Cannibal puns. <laughs> uh, I, I read that a little bit differently where I see it as him showing up, I think she knows it's going to cause at least somewhat of a stir. I don't think it's going to... so that she may have some extra time But I don't think... I don't think it's a play thing. Thing. (laughs) Um, Because I think in the previous scene, she... The reason... The reason I don't think this is that Bedelia was so uncomfortable in that first dinner moment Mm -hmm. with them. She was so... Visibly shaking as she's eating Like, visibly shaking as she's... she can't even raise it to her mouth. She bends down to the plate. She recognizes this guy knows entirely... This guy is very... He's very clever... He's very smart. He's snappy. He sees something. She's not sure what at this point. We find that out in this next in this scene that we're talking about. But Bedelia recognizes this guy sees something and Hannibal is not going to let him there's no way this guy is going to survive. So I don't think mm-hmm. she views him as a plaything. I think she absolutely sees you are going to die. Yes. And the way that you die will not be will not be quick and merc- like merciless. You will die because he deems you as a threat and also you're rude well, and which, you're catty. Which is interesting too because later on in the episode, Dimon's death is not grandiose. We see Hannibal literally just hit him over the head with an Aristotle bust. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, back to the back to the scene at Hannibal's lecture. Um, the reason I brought up the uh, the parallel to the asylum in the second season and the this the way that the room looks the same is that it's almost Hannibal holding court in the way that Chilton did. It's, interesting. It's Hannibal. Interesting. You know, he's got his own little. That's interesting. You know, he, I like, did not see that that way at all. That's he, really interesting. Yeah, he's got his own little. Um, you know. What are those called? The king. The king has. They're not peasants. They're jesters. Not jesters. They're servants. Knights. It's like another word for people, but it's like common people. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> it's almost it's it's Hannibal holding court with this group of intellectuals that he sees himself obviously as he views everyone as they're better, mm-hmm. um, and it's his own little playground. He is the king of his castle in that room, in the same way that I think uh, Chilton viewed all of his patients at the asylum. Yeah, um, which again I think will play out throughout the season. Um, but then um, you have this final conversation between Dimond and Hannibal, and Dimond seems to make him an offer of something. No, really? <laughs> no, I mean I don't think it's like a I don't think it's a sexual. No, I thing absolutely or... think it's a sexual thing. I absolutely one hundred percent think it's a sexual thing because I think that is what sets Hannibal over the edge. There is a part of me that believes that he maybe would have considered him not a contemporary, but he would have at least spared him. But Dimond went so far as to make a sexual innuendo of, I'm not here to twist you into an uncomfortable, into an uncomfortable position. I'm here to twist you out of it. And I think that that was such a blatant sexual offer that Hannibal was so offended by it. That that was like the straw that broke the camel's back, and that's like that's why he was like, "I have to kill you." That is mean, so insufferably I think, rude. I don't think that's the straw that broke the camel's back because I think this the moment that Dimon shows up in Florence and recognizes well, yeah, Hannibal. Sure, yeah, that's that in and of itself signs his death warrant because Absolutely. this is the only thing that can disturb Hannibal's peace in this moment. Yeah, um, I think I don't know. So I don't, I, th- I don't I, think it's because of. The sexual one, you know, but I, I mean, I didn't read it that way. I, I read no, it. No, that's complete sexual <laughs> innuendo. Okay. okay. <laughs> there was that's no impossible. one in this episode that wanted to get laid more than Anthony Dimond. <laughs> uh, okay. 
<laughs> yes, he he was trying very hard. He was hard. really gunning for it. Um, and then, uh, so Hannibal brings Mr. Dimmon back to his home. And he finds Bedelia suitcase in hand, ready to go. Yep. Um, and honestly, I think that in that moment, I think he probably may have had a grandiose plan for Dimond in a way of, of he was going to kill him in some extravagant way. Um, but for it to be literally him reaching for something at hand and killing Dimond, I think it's in that moment where he sees Bedelia leaving and he notices the suitcase that he just immediately, he's, I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this killing more about her then I am going to make it about dimmed or preserving my peace. Well, yeah. And I'm going to make a point to right. Bedelia. Well, he even asked her, you know, did you know what was going to happen if you left the seminar? And she says yes. Is he talking about her leaving the seminar? Yeah. He literally asked, like, did you know what was going to happen? Okay, because I was really curious. In, the, in that dialogue exchange, I couldn't quite track exactly... Yeah. what he was referring to because it almost made it seem like Bedelia had had like there's a you know an, a cut scene somewhere where Bedelia is talking to Dimond just no. one on one no I, 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 I interpreted that to mean him just very straightforward asking did you know what, did you know this was going to happen mm -hmm. and she very much says yes she was completely aware from day one, um, what would happen? Yes. I which mean, as, then as leads into yes. the, yeah, which then leads into the, you know, are you observing or are you participating? Um, debate, which is not really even a debate. No, it's, it's him scientifically proving to her that she's participating. Yeah. I love his performance, too, in that scene where he asks her that question, are you observing or participating in for the first time, really, we see Hannibal almost be mad. He's, it's, you know, it's a kind of, the way he says that line is almost like a slap to the face of, like, wake up, come here. It's very aggressive. Get it, back. Aggressive. It's very aggressive, yes. In a way, I think that's why he simply grabbed the Aristotle bust and slugged Dimon, is in that moment, he's, he's acting out of impulse, a little bit, and he, and so you see him in in Mads's performance a little bit. You see him start to lose control a little bit. He's not that calm, cool, and collected Hannibal that we've again, always seen. Which, yeah, I mean, that plays directly into he, again. I think a this more unhinged. It's, he, well, he's human. Yeah. He's human. He's not in control as he as he so normally is. You see him in different stages of that. Like he's, you know, this is this is an episode where he's not as cool, calm, and collected as we've seen him in seasons past. Mm -hmm. He's definitely more human. Um, he's more in his element, but in a lot of ways, he's also out of it because mm -hmm. of the fact that he is losing that control, mm -hmm. like you just said. So. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the scene, we see uh, Bedelia trapped again in, you know, in that moment where he says, may I take your coat? Yeah. And he takes her coat from her, and you just see that She's so perfectly still, just standing there, staring off into space as he takes her her jacket off, that she's just trapped. Yeah. She's stuck in this situation. Moving on from that scene, we get another flashback with uh, Abel Gideon. Not so Abel Gideon. Now we get the payoff of Hannibal cooking the snails, making some escargot. Um... And we get this very heated exchange between them where you see, just I love not so able Gideon just <laughs> knocking that knife against the table yeah. repeatedly, just purposely trying to irritate Hannibal. You know, later at the scene when he eats the escargot, you just hear him drop the knife to the floor. You know, he's very much, he's pushing Hannibal's buttons to just go, dude, just kill me, just kill me. Please, just kill me. And so he's he's been searching throughout the episode, for, you know, for what that yeah. exact button is going to be. And yeah. I think in this scene, he's finally, at, sadly, at, this may be the last we see of not so able Gideon. I think I, I tend to agree with you. He's he's trying to push as as hard as he can to just get this guy to kill him. Mm -hmm. um, 
but he's doing it in a way that he knows is very personal and that will hit home the hardest, which is Will Graham, mm -hmm. um, which uh, leads us into our last scene. Well, one more thing about that scene that I was going to say is it going back to the eye lines that we talked about earlier with, mm -hmm. you know, the parallels of Silence of the Lambs and looking directly into the camera. Yeah. In previous scenes, it's been Hannibal that's looking in, directly into the camera and everyone else is kind of off to the side and, you know, they've got, for film terms, they have regular eye lines. Yeah. Um, and in this scene, it plays out almost completely with uh, Gideon's eye line and Hannibal's eye lines both being directly into the camera. So that, Interesting. that power dynamic yeah. has come... Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's come to a head. They, yeah. they have. Yeah. This is as firm as Gideon can be. Yeah. You know this. Well, is, because he's at last using the one person he knows can get to Hannibal. Mm -hmm. He's he's directly addressing the elephant in the room, which is Will Graham. Which and, yes, but in in the timeline of things, like that relationship has not had not disintegrated yes. to the point. And, and that uh, it has yet. And I believe... But I think... I, I believe that Will is still in prison. Uh, when he was eating Abel? Mm hmm I think so, too. Yeah. But I think... I so think, there's a little bit... I mean, he's lost his dinner buddy. Yes. In that. So yeah. He, yeah. He is definitely alone and isolated, and he yeah. wants somebody to eat with him. Mm hmm Um, he's just doing it in his own twisted little way. <laughs> but, uh... So yes, we have uh, we have our that's our final flashback of the episode, and that is bookended by Hannibal on a train. I have a lot of feelings about this last scene. How so? <laughs> no good feelings, like feelings like I. This is the reason that like this last scene is. Oh man, this last scene is the reason that I love this show so much. Is because it this whole episode has given us so much. Uh, subtext and so many through lines to, to kind of digest, so to speak. Um, this last this last sequence with him on the train uh, cut with the gift that he leaves at the chapel um, is why I, I, why I keep coming back to this show and why I keep loving this show so much. But, yeah. Him leaving that torso in that church is going to be the kickoff for bringing... Will and Jack and Alana back into the fold yeah. of of hunting Hannibal. It's it's him leaving a calling card yeah um, somewhere, and you know it goes straight down to the name of the episode is antipasto, mm -hmm. which in Italian cuisine is a pre meal yeah. snack or dinner. It's it's little meats and cheeses and right. you know it's almost like a little appetizer. It's a little uh, meat and cheese plate you know, before the meal. They gave us a, a, a little closed story for Bedelia. They set us up for Hannibal um, having to disturb his own peace and reach back out to uh, Jack and Will. And then, you know, how that carries out through the rest of the season, we'll see. So, yeah, I think that about covers all of the scenes in recapping them. Uh, so... Now we are going to move on to potential spoilers and conjecture. So if you don't want to be spoiled about anything or are not interested in what the books have to say. Um, then, stop listening right now. Yes, stop listening. Shut it off. We are going to give you a few seconds and then we will jump into where we think this show is going this season. I had a thought. Well, I can't say that it was my thought. Uh, the is it De La Rentis? So De La Rentis company uh, posted on their Twitter something that I am completely obsessed with right now, and I think will be the continuing theme of this season. Um, specifically with the the image that this episode left us with, which was the torso in the shape of the heart. Uh, mm -hmm. propped up on what appeared to be a, a, a three swords, if you will. Um, they tweeted a specific image, and you can were find it. They, they were, it was either like a sword or it was like an easel prop. 
like impaled a, in the yeah. in the torso. But you can find this image uh, with the comparison image on uh, the De Laurentiis Company Twitter. Uh, because they tweeted an image, a still from the episode, specifically of the torso, uh, next to the uh, tarot card for the yeah. um, Three of Swords. Um, which, if you're familiar with tarot, the Three of Swords literally represents heartbreak, loneliness, and betrayal. Um, three of Swords or Three Swords? Three of Swords. Yeah. Um, and there's a more in-depth... Uh, synopsis of what that card really means if you google it you know you can find it on any tarot card site really but i thought that that was interesting specifically because i think that will be the through line of this entire season dealing with the uh, repercussions of last season specifically with the finale with will uh, and hannibal's relationship with the betrayal that he that hannibal felt he experienced and then also in this episode, uh, the loneliness that he was dealing with, because I think that there was a lot of, uh, I think there was a lot of subtext in the conversation that Bedelia and Hannibal have, where Bedelia says, you know, I'm, I could no longer offer you an adequate substitute to therapy, and Hannibal later comes back and says, well, Graham was not an a suitable substitute for therapy. So I think that there, I think this season we'll see a lot of, they'll touch a lot on uh, the heartbreak and the loneliness and the betrayal that Hannibal feels at the hands of Will Graham. Um, but I love, I love that imagery. I, I love that the show actually literally went there and was like, here's a tarot card brought to life by a torso on an artist easel. So I think that that's so interesting that the three predominant characters that we see in this episode, Hannibal, Abel, and Bedelia, are all embodying those different aspects of the Three of Swords, which is, again, that heartbreak, loneliness, betrayal that Hannibal is feeling. So who's heartbreak? Hannibal. Who's loneliness? Loneliness is uh, Abel. You think so? Every time, every... Every conversation that they had was I would something feel that to Hannibal do. Hannibal is more loneliness than Abel. No, what I'm saying though is that either Hannibal, so Hannibal himself is encapsulating the heartbreak. Abel is throwing Hannibal's loneliness in his face because he has that conversation where he says, "Snails are not the only creatures that you know like to eat in company." Or, "I wonder what's going to happen to you when this ha like I wonder how you're going to react when this happens to you when someone does this to mm -hmm. you because right now you view yourself on the top of the food chain. So what happens when somebody knocks you down?" And Bedelia is literally working her way to the betrayal because again, there's that Judas through line with her character of you know is she sitting at the train station? looking at the camera as a cry for help or is she looking at the camera because she's looking at her escape her her, her exit doors um either way i feel like bedelia definitely embodies the betrayal aspect of it abel is throwing the loneliness in his face and hannibal himself is wrestling with his own heartbreak i read it more just in this first impression of it because i'm finding out about that tarot card but i'm reading it more as Hannibal is all three. Um, I mean, that's not to say that's not to say that he's not dealing with them himself. I, I but think, I, I, think I, that I just Bedelia think that there's... is going to be the agent of his betrayal. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I see it more of that. Literally, it's his heart. He he feels lonely. He feels heartbroken, and he fe feels betrayed. And so he's calling out. And it's the catalyst for everything that's going to happen this season. Because obviously, Will Graham and Jack Crawford are going to come back into it. And it, I think it's going to happen a lot sooner than we think it is. Going back to last season, was it episode 6 or 7 that Will got out of jail? I want to say it was 7. Um, Maybe. So Brian Fuller, in an interview with Variety... Uh, stated that the first six episodes are going to be the Italian arc, and then which is similar to the structure of the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're if we're being honest, like Hannibal, or yeah, Hannibal the book literally has like several chapters where it's literally just 
Italy. Mm-hmm. It doesn't explore anything else. It's about the the first. It's half about Potsy. Yeah. It's about Inspector Potsy. Mm-hmm. Which we'll get to here in a second because I think that Professor Soliato, I think, is going to take Potsy's place in um, being the person to root out Hannibal. Yeah. And meet the uh, the unceremonious end of being hung from the palazzo, disemboweled. Mm. Um, Whoa! I just had a thought, mm-hmm. and this might be like I don't know if they did this. It would be like epically like Game of Thrones level fucked up. But what if Bedelia was the one that was hung from the palazzo with her bowels hanging out? I'm only I'm only saying this. I'm only thinking this because of the fact of she was sitting in on that lecture. Mm-hmm. With the hand placement on the shoulder, like, it's just... In the way that it plays out in the book, it's Yeah, Potsy in the book, it's him that's sitting there that's instead sitting of her. during that yes. lecture. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, interesting. Mm. Oof. I hope that's not her. Oh, God, but what if? <laughs> oh, my God. I would be... That would be terrible. Yes, that would be really awful. I would so much rather it be Soliato. But uh, going back to what I was saying about that art, that interview in Variety, um, you can find it online. Just search Variety, Brian Fuller, Hannibal Season 3, and you'll find it. Um, but he has said the first six episodes are going to be the Italian arc, and then the last seven, or maybe the other way around, maybe first seven, last six, um, are the Red Dragon arc. Nice. Later on in the season, we already know that Francis Dollarhide and Reba have already been cast as Richard Armitage and... Rutina Wesley. Rutina Wesley. Um, Which, welcome back to my television, Tara from True Blood. (laughs) um, So we already know that they've been cast, so that's going to feature pretty heavily. And then reading this article in Variety, we can see that, yes, definitely it will. Yeah. Um, It's going to be the last half of the season so my thinking is in finding that article that Hannibal has to be in chains for the for the red dragon story to really kick off I think so too um well and something that's very very telling about that that you brought up you brought it up earlier today actually the reason that you know we tend to think on that level is just simply because of the fact that in the teaser for, you know, the season that played after this first episode, Hannibal himself says, you know, well, Bedelia says, you know, there's only one way that you'll forgive Will Graham. And Hannibal says, I have to eat him. Mm -hmm. Um, That lends to the thinking that Hannibal has to be in chains because in the books, he gets the tooth fairy to go after Will. Mm-hmm. It definitely gives him a reason. Yes. Uh, yeah. Beyond just Hannibal in the books, it in the book Red Dragon, it's much. It comes across more of of Hannibal playing with Will Graham because uh, they don't necessarily have that personal relationship no, that they have on not, the show. Not at all. You know, they not at all. they've met twice before Hannibal's in prison. Hannibal tries to kill him the second time they meet. Right. Then they just talk once or twice i think in person and then most of the other times on the phone um throughout the book red dragon so they don't have that personal relationship so it comes across in the book as much more of like hannibal just playing his he's having his little experiments which we've seen him do you know he's in a way with will graham he's experimenting with somebody that he he smells that um what is that disease that uh, Will has in the second season? It's uh, or in the first season. He knows that he has it, and they go to the doctor, and oh, the doctor diagnoses yeah. him. Yeah, 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 yeah. He kills the doctor so it doesn't get out. Um, once he finds that out about Will, Will becomes that perfect candidate for him to experiment with um, and try his, you know, specific drug cocktail of making Will forget where he is and what's going on and you know you have the clocks and he builds that psychosis to almost cover his own path but he's also just encephalitis encephalitis um that's what it is he um he's building thing to cover his own path but he's also uh just experimenting he's he's a doctor he's curious he's playing with will he's Mm -hmm. you know um 
just out of his own curiosity, seeing what would happen. Yeah. If he, you know, if he did something. Well, and he's a ma he's a he's a master manipulator. Mm -hmm. That's what he does, and and we see him doing it to Bedelia from the instant that he walks in and sees her, you know, having killed a guy. We see him doing it to her too. Mm -hmm. That's why. And and going back to what we had talked about earlier, now we can kind of discuss it. Um, do we think that he drugged Bedelia the way he drugged mm -hmm. Will? Very, I very much so think I so. I think so too. I yeah. think we we are yeah. going to find out later this season that. Sure enough, it was Hannibal that killed. There's a reason. There's her. there's a reason that, that he says he that she says uh, he was your patient before he was mine. Mm -hmm. I think there's a reason that that has that 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 has to come into play. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then you well because we what we know of Hannibal is that he likes to uh, he likes to manipulate, but he also likes to dissect and he likes to set people that he feels. Uh, in seasons past, we've seen him do this. Uh, he likes to set people that maybe have inclinations or uh, drives towards the murderous. He likes to set them on their path. He likes to steer them to that darker direction. Very much so, yeah. So what I think, and this is complete speculation, of course, but I think what we'll see with that patient, with that former patient of his, is that we will have seen that he has set that patient on a specific path, and it comes directly into the path of Bedelia, and Bedelia, yes, I think maybe that, being drugged, that patient kills have, him. That patient may have been one of his uh, his first experiment that we know about, maybe. and then Bedelia became yeah. his own little experiment, yeah. and then Will became an experiment after that. Sure, and it's, it's curious. I'm curious to know how much. He, how much Hannibal knows? Hannibal yeah. obviously knows that one of either Jack Crawford, Alana yeah. Bloom, yeah. or Will Graham is yeah. alive because yeah. he goes and leaves the heart torso yeah. at the end. Yeah. Um, but does he know? I mean, does he know that all three of them are alive? How much does Hannibal know? Is what I, I'm really curious. This is to my see thing. How that's going like, to play out in episode two and beyond? Watching. Watching the manipulation that he has put Will, that he's attempted to put Will through, the manipulation that he is currently successful with Bedelia, there's, <laughs> there's a part of me that's like, knowing what comes next, you know, God willing, rights willing, uh, with Clarice. There's a part of me that looks at the, the Will manipulations mm -hmm. and the Bedelia manipulations and just sort of sees them as like, him playing or not even playing it's him experimenting it's ex again it's him, it's, it, it, it's him yeah. experimenting for this ultimate manipulation that will be Clarice if Clarice is a character that they can get their hands on and push into another season because yeah, I mean, as we know from the books he successfully the, the brainwashing aspect of it Maybe not so much. He maybe doesn't successfully brainwash her so much as he successfully... My belief is that he successfully manipulates Clarice. Successfully where, traps her. Yes, whereas with Will and with Bedelia, there's still something in them that mm -hmm. bucks against that. And that that part of that, the... Th there's a survival instinct in them. And, and, not, and not even... I don't even think that Clarice lacks... An, uh, I don't think Clarice lacks a survival instinct. I just think that there's something that he succeeds with her that he doesn't succeed with Will or Bedelia. This is all completely speculation because yeah. they may never actually get the rights to Clarice. Yeah. So we may never actually see that character. But what I'm, what I in my own little head verse keep thinking is like, these are all experiments that don't go his way until Clarice comes into the into I play. I think Bedelia is I, I don't th I think he, his use for Bedelia is strictly um, utilitarian. Yeah, I, don't, oh, I think his yeah. experiment with Bedelia. I think his experiment with Bedelia really ended um, once Will Graham came into play because Absolutely. you see him. Absolutely. You know, she becomes his psychiatrist, and yeah. then she. I mean, it's interesting that the people that survive his experiments are the people that leave. Yeah. And she turned him down as a patient. 
Yeah. And then Will in the books gets out. Yeah. Does, is no longer an investigator. Yeah. You know, I'm sure Hannibal still sends him fan mail. Yeah. But he leaves. And the one person that doesn't, because she is so young and driven and it's that interesting dynamic that plays up in Silence of the Lambs, the book and the movie Mm -hmm. of a woman in a man's world. She's constantly out to prove herself. And so she's constantly um, going back. She's chasing. She's going to keep chasing. She's never going to give up. And I think that's why, you know, she ends up. I mean, on the show, you see a lot of the fact that they are working around the rights situation where they are giving a lot of the Clarice Hannibal line. They're giving that in equal parts to Bedelia and to Will. And also, which um, is understandable. And also I Jack's get it. first, uh, his first little pet that Hannibal trapped in the pit. Yes. Um, yeah. The girl that's on V. Miriam Lass. Miriam Lass, AKA, the Clary Starling that we can't have. <laughs> Fake Clarice. <laughs> Fake Clarice. Um, but to bring it back to this episode, I don't think Bedelia is one of his experiments anymore, and so I don't think that... I think she's doomed. She is on her way out. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be the way that Potsy, Inspector Potsy goes out in the book. Yeah. I, th- I think that's an interesting thought. Uh, I don't want that to be. I would much rather that be Soliato. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they're definitely going to give Soliato Potsy's story beats throughout the season where he's gonna, they're going to have that playful uh, back and forth. And My question to you, do you think that they would introduce the, um, the plot that Potsy had in the book of the uh, he hires the pickpockets? And uh, Hannibal actually, like, catches on and slices one of the main arteries in the pickpocket's leg. I think that's do definitely a real possibility. Do you think that's going to be something that'll th- happen? Th- yeah. And I mean, also, do you think that they will connect uh, Potsy and Mason Verger? Because in the book, that's a big, big connection Soliato. that happens. No, Potsy. Well, like, yeah, but in this Potsy, case, I don't think it's going to be Soliato. You think it'll be Soliato? I think, I think Soliato is completely because taking the place of Potsy. I think, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think that the, my hope anyway is that they will connect uh, because, we, you know, Mason Verger, Michael Pitt as Mason Verger is so brilliant. Oh, and we've I want to see more of him. We've I know that we're going to see preview, him. Yeah. I, I know that we'll see more of him this season. My hope is that we will see... Uh, we will see that connection between Verger and what's going on in Florence. Um, so you 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 tend to think it'll be Saliato that'll take the the the, the ransom money mm-hmm. that'll say, okay, I'll I'll give you Hannibal for this mm-hmm. money. I don't think Saliato is a strictly noble character. I think that definitely no. plays into God. In, no, absolutely <laughs> that definitely not. plays no. into his character yeah, no, he's of taking a, a large bribe, right? Right. To My question, though, I'm, I I would be interested to see if and they don't for, hire the Don't pit forget pockets. that he uh, he is also in that scene where Hannibal is talking a lot about betrayal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, for a bag of silver. For for a bag of silver. For a bag of silver, Judas. You too can get hung from a balcony with your bowels hanging out. Yes. <laughs> um. That scene is much more concentrated on Bedelia, but. Yeah. Uh, I really hope that that plays out with Soliato instead, um, yeah. where he's constantly chasing Hannibal, and and it comes back to bite him. I still think she was sitting at that train to alert people that he's in Florence, because he's he went on a train and I don't know took well, the body I guess we'll, somewhere we'll, else. We'll find out. They're gonna start looking in we'll Europe, and they're gonna see her on that monitor. We'll find out, <laughs> we'll and they're gonna see. know he's in Florence. Yeah. Because, you know, at some point, they've got to catch him in six episodes. So yeah. that's not a whole lot of time for them to be working on it. Yeah. Um, and I guess we'll find out a lot more about all of our favorite characters, all of our favorite good guys, next episode when uh, we flash sideways to them. Um, all right. Well, I think that's probably about it, as much as we know um, so far. Um where can they find us on Twitter, Josh? Uh, they can find us on Twitter at a la carte pod. And then... Um, How do you spell it? <laughs> A-L-A-C-R... 
No. <laughs> A-L-A-C-A-R-T-E-P-O-D. That's, That's a la carte pod. Yes. <laughs> um, and then also you can reach out to us via email at a la carte podcast at gmail.com. Um, promise we will take a look at them because there's probably going to be about 10 of you. But uh, <laughs> if we're lucky. If we're lucky. We can't, <laughs> we're not going to get anything. Um, where can they find you online, Brit Bird? Oh my God. Why would they want to find me online? Well, you do interesting things. And you- Britt L. Bird on Twitter. That's Britt with two T's. Where can they find you, Josh Carter? I am at at Josh B. Carter. Um, you can find both of us online there. And we will see you all next week with another episode of A La Carte Podcast. Bonsoir. Bonsoir.